Good morning. It is the Lord's Day. It's October 8th of 2023. Our theme today is Melchizedek. I'd like to read the scripture and there are a whole 21 verses. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and he blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first by translation of his name, king of righteousness. Then he's the king of Salem, that is, the king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembled the Son of God. He continues a priest forever. See how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of his spoils. And the descendants of Levi, who receive priestly offering, have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, their brothers, though they are descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men. On the other case, by those who testify that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people receive the law, what farther need would there be for another priest to arrive after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named under the order of Aaron? Well, there, where there's a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For of the one who spoken belong to another tribe from whom no one has ever served at the altar. It is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with the tribe, Moses said nothing about priest. This becomes more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not based on a legal requirement concerning body descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For as witness of him, you are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. For on one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, a better hope is introduced, through which we draw near to God, and it was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath, but this one was made priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord is sworn, will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Well, you might wonder why we're going to talk about an elusive character like Melchizedek, and you might be wondering what spiritual help is this going to give me today? And I'm here to say this is foundational truth, and foundational truth in our heart helps build our faith and helps us to respond to moral truth. In the Jewish mind, Jesus was of the tribe of Judah, and he could call himself king of kings, but he could not be a priest because only the tribe of Levi could be a priest. Now, Melchizedek had a pre-existing priesthood that existed before the Ten Commandments and the Levite priesthood was set up. And so Jesus was a priest, not by the order of Levite, but by the order of Melchizedek. This is important to the Jews. It ties the New Testament Savior that they had come to know, but they were struggling with, how does this fit in all I learned about the Old Testament? It ties the Savior to the Old Testament tabernacle. And it makes the Old Testament tabernacle fulfilled in Jesus. To the Gentiles, it ties to us, it 
it ties the Old Testament to our gospel and Savior because we think all that stuff is junk, get rid of it, pass away, and now we know that Christ fulfilled it all. Melchizedek is an important and strategic person in biblical history because he brings legitimacy to the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you may have said, well, I don't really care if Jesus was a priest or not. He's my Savior. But I'm here to tell you, if Jesus is not your priest, he cannot be your Savior. And I'm here to tell you that he's in heaven praying for you and doing his priestly ministry now. So there is a foundational truth we need to understand. The first thing we're going to look at when we look at uh, Melchizedek is his identity. Who was this guy? Well, he was the king of Salem, which is the prince or king of peace. Jesus was called the prince of peace. Some people believe he was the king of Jerusalem, and that may be a possibility. It was a major city. His name translated means king of righteousness. Well, that is Christ. He was known as the priest of the Most High God. And it says he has no beginning and end. That means because we don't know who his mother and father are, his genealogy, and all of this. So the question, of course, has always been true for scholars, and that is, is he an elusive historical character? Or is this what we call a Christology? A pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second thing we know about him is he received tithes from Abraham. That means that, number one, he had authority, and number two, he was recognized by Abraham himself. And here's another thing I'd like to say. I'll call him a no-brand believer. A no-brand believer. <clears throat> We don't know what to do with someone in the Old Testament who wasn't a Jew, <clears throat> lived in Gentile lands, and called himself the Most High Priest of God and worshipped the Messiah. We don't know what to do with a guy like that because we don't know what he really believes. And so this is Melchizedek. He was, secondly, an intermediator. The tithe and the blessing. This is very important. Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, which is he recognized his priesthood. The Levites were required to receive tithes. That's part of priestly ministry. And Melchizedek gave a blessing to Abraham. And the scripture says it's quite clear that the inferior is always blessed by the superior. We also read that the Levitical priesthood was mortal. It means they came, they lived, they died, and they were replaced by another generation. Melchizedek, it just says he lives. I don't know if that's a snapshot of that moment or if it means he has eternal life. Conclusion is Abraham, by his recognition and tithing and receiving a blessing, makes the priesthood of Melchizedek legitimate. And we also see that Melchizedek is greater than Abraham, and Abraham was revered as the father of the Jewish nation. Now then there's this thing called inherited action. And there's a statement here. It says, <clears throat> Levi, meaning the Levitical priesthood, tithe to Melchizedek, which means that Melchizedek was a higher level of priesthood, that they recognized him. How did they tithe to him since he was gone a few hundred years before the Levites even came into being. Well, it says Levi 
was in Abraham's loins when he tied to him. Um, I'm going to check out for a while right here. Because I have to tell you, I can't think this way. I grew up like you did. Americans are individualistic. We're responsible for our own actions, not somebody else's. We don't think back generations and generations. A lot of our people came from the old country, and we lost track of them and what our great-great-grandfathers did. We've kind of lost track of them. Some people do genealogical studies and find a few humorous things, but we've lost track of them. We also are into compartmentalization. This is, belongs here, and this belongs here, and this belongs here, and you don't mix the two. It's hard for me to say and think that Levi was in Abraham's loins, and therefore, because Abraham tithe, Levi did. It's hard for me to think about actions and decisions that are generational. I'm so independent and self-centered, I don't think of family in that sense. But in the Bible, they did. Let's look at Exodus 34, 6 and 7. <clears throat> the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Uh, who will, but who will no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquities of the father on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. What the Bible says, if you commit these sins, four generations after you will suffer because of it. And we've seen that in families, especially in alcoholism and drug abuse and those kind of things. It just goes on for generations. It's also true with morality and even sometimes divorce. Deuteronomy 24, 16 said, Fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers. Each one shall be put to death for his own sin. So even back in those days, they did not punish you for the sins of your parents or your children. But the effects of these things were felt for generations and generations. And here's one of the things I have to say. The conclusion of this is that Melchizedek is greater than Levi. Melchizedek is greater than Levi. But I wonder in our land that we live, if everybody stopped and thought that what I do today will affect my great-grandchildren and how they make decisions and the decisions they make, I wonder if we would make different decisions. I'm here to say that in our day, we raise people with slogans that says, have it your way, you deserve a break today. We raise people like that, and they have the idea that it's all about them and they can have whatever they want. They don't think about their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, their great-great-grandchildren. They don't think about that till they get about 40 years old. And by that time, they got wild oats springing up all over the place. But this used to be the thinking that your grandfather and your great-grandfather, what they did affects you, and what you do affects the generations to come. So, what Melchizedek was, was an intermediator between God and Abraham, and Abraham recognized him, and so did Levi. Now, the third thing we find in our text is a inferior priesthood. And it says this, that the Old Testament Levitical priesthood did not gain perfection. You know, it didn't really solve and stop sin. In fact, Hebrews 10.4 
tells us it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. And then if we look in Hebrews 11.39, we find that all these great people in the faith chapter, chapter 11, who put faith in God did not receive what was promised. So why did they not receive it? Because the real priest had not come, and the real sacrifice had not happened, the real covenant was not in place, and that's why when Jesus died on the cross and said, it's finished, then all of these people could receive their promise. The scripture says when there's a change of priesthood, there's obviously a change of law and a change of covenant. If we look in Hebrews 7.25, the scripture says, He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession. And Hebrews 10.14 says, For by a single offering he perfected those who are being sanctified for all time, once for all. This is what Jesus did. Now, the fourth thing we have is an indestructible life. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. Melchizedek, his qualification from priesthood was that he had an indestructible life. Now, Levi, each one of the Levites became a priest from successionism. Similar to Catholicism, we call it apostolic succession. The first pope uh, became the pope according, and God made him the pope, and then it succeeds, and the fathers go on and on and on. And uh, the Episcopal Church believes something similar. Apostolic succession. But Melchizedek was not succeeded from anybody, nor did he pass it down to anybody. He was the high priest because he had an indestructible life. He had no father, no mother, no genealogy, no beginning, no end. And this is either an unknown character or the reincarnate Christ. Jesus was qualified to be a priest because he was the witness of a forever priesthood because he had an indestructible life. He said, I am alive forevermore in the book of Revelation. Now, the last thing is an irrevocable oath. The scripture says, especially in the last scripture, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. And earlier in this passage, it says you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Well, where did the Lord make this statement? And it was in Psalms 110, 1 through 4, which is a messianic psalm. First, it says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool. And that's God saying to Jesus, Come up and sit on my right hand. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely in the day of your power and holy garments from the womb of the morning the dew of the youth will be yours and then he says the lord has sworn and will not change his mind you are a priest forever according to the oath of melchizedek now the levites they were installed by a vote of the people or something they weren't installed by an oath of god they just succeeded their father or grandfather or whatever. And here are the things that was set aside for Jesus to become the high priest. The former commandment was set aside. Now we have a new commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, mind, strength, your neighbors, yourself. The former covenant was set aside. And coming up in a couple chapters, we will learn about a new covenant. 
The former tabernacle was set aside. The new tabernacle is not a symbolic tabernacle, but actually in the throne of heaven, Jesus goes through and sits on the right hand of the Father. The former priesthood is set aside. Yes, the former priesthood is set aside. And the summary of all of this is verse 19. It says, A better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. We have a better hope and a better relationship. Now, in conclusion, I would like to say this again. Melchizedek is a very important person because he ties the Old Testament and the New Testament together. For those first century Jews who had come to the Lord, but they didn't know what to do with the tabernacle and the priesthood and the sacrifices and all of that, Melchizedek proved that Jesus was the great high priest and brought it all together for them. For those of us who are like me, I came to the Lord, I found Jesus, knew him as my Savior, and I didn't even know that they had a sacrifice, and offering. I didn't know any of that stuff that went on. And some people say, well, that's cultural, and it doesn't apply today, and some people want to rip the Bible right in half and throw the Old Testament right out the door. But the fact is, is Melchizedek ties the two together to where we understand that the New Testament is the fulfillment of the symbolism in the Old Testament, that Christ fulfills the tabernacle I know A.B. Simpson wrote a set of commentaries called Christ in the Tabernacle. How true. Well, the result of this is we have a better priesthood, a better law, a better covenant, and a better relationship with God. Now, let me ask you about your relationship to God. And I ask you today, if you were to die today, do you know you have eternal life? And I'm here to tell you that you can have eternal life. It's very simple. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Jesus came and took our sins and put them on his record and put his righteousness on our record. And God forgave us. Our problem is not with God. The challenge we have today is believing that Christ died on the cross, believing that he took our sins away, and accepting the free gift of eternal life. There are so many people that have so much pride, they don't want to believe that they're sinners. There are so many people that have so much pride, they don't want to humble themselves and say, Lord, I can't save myself I'm a sinner come into my heart. And there are so many people that think they're going to save themselves and do it on their own. But I tell you what, the Lord has a way of putting people in place where they know they can't. So I'm here today to preach this gospel that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. And he says to all, come on to me, you who are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And so I invite you today to say, Jesus, I am a sinner. Forgive my sins. Come into my heart and be my Savior. And the joy of the Lord is this, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for this day. Thank you for Melchizedek, for this foundational truth. And thank you for the gospel that calls us to something better than what we have. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.